Good evening and welcome to a new episode of Unspun. I'm your host, Mark Basant. Often branded as spin doctors, journalists are sometimes accused of twisting the facts. We want to guarantee you that we'll unspin that theory. Over the next hour, this comprehensive show will bring you up to speed with the stories that matter the most to you, our viewers. We're digging deep to bring you investigative and special reports and to always ensure it's all factual. In this episode, a special look into the tenure of Commissioner of Police, Gary Griffith, and if he has what it takes to again hold the post for another three years as he has signaled his intention to reapply for the position that other senior police officers may also be eyeing. Joshua C. Munger breaks down Griffith's performance in a special report later. This year marks five years since the mother of two and hairdresser Ria Sukdev was abducted and vanished without a trace. Otto Carrington takes a look back at that story in this segment of The Missing. In this episode, we'll also bring you an update on an exclusive story we brought to you two weeks ago about a teenage boy who was taken to Syria at the age of nine and later captured, but was denied re-entry into Trinidad in January. Stay tuned. There are very few occasions when Police Commissioner Gary Griffith does not have the final say, but on August 18th, he certainly won't. Rather, the Police Service Commission will. As the Commissioner's three-year contract comes to an end one day before that, it remains to be seen if he will be granted another term. Griffith has already confirmed that he wants it, but so do several other candidates. So is Commissioner Griffith the right person to continue leading the police service? Or should someone else be given the reins of a stressful and demanding job that needs constant attention? Tonight, with the help of crime experts, senior reporter Joshua Simungal examines Griffith's three-year term in office in this special report. But over the last eight days, I have been on the headlines on four occasions. I wish to inform the media, I know there's a love for Gary Griffith, there's a tabanka for Gary Griffith. I wish to give you all the bad news that I'm already married. Whether you like him or not, in his three years in office, Police Commissioner Gary Griffith has pushed himself and the service to the forefront of the national psyche. It was on August 6, 2018, that the former National Security Minister became the country's first substantive police commissioner since 2012. His appointment came at a time of weakened public confidence in the police service. Since 2013, according to the TTPS's statistics, the country averaged more than 437 murders and 12,160 serious crimes per year. When Griffith arrived, the country was heading towards the 500 murder mark for the first time since 2009. Internally, the service also faced long-standing management issues. As I stated before, um, initially, there would be no honeymoon period. I do not expect any. I have an enormous task, but this is not going to be a Gary Griffith show. I intend to work as much as possible with all stakeholders, inclusive of the citizens of this country, to ensure that their most fundamental rights would be adhered to. What I bring to the table would be seen in due, in due course. What I can assure you is that my, my job and my intention is to ensure public trust and confidence is brought back to the police service. I will be doing much less talk and more action this time around. In Commissioner Griffith's first term, there's been a lot of action, but also a lot of lip service. This dynamic saw him become one of the country's most polarized social figures. His leadership style has been compared to one of the country's most well-known commissioners, the late Randolph Burroughs, a comparison he shunned. And with his contract coming to an end on August 18th of this year, the Police Service Commission has a big decision on its hands. While Griffith is seeking another term, the question remains, does he merit a second term? Or will the Service Commission opt for another candidate? Time will tell, but let's scrutinize Griffith's first term in office. One of the main parameters that Police Commissioners is judged upon is crime statistics. According to the TTPS's figures, in Griffith's first full year in office 2019, 
the number of reported crimes declined by more than 2,500 reports from 2018. 2020 then saw the largest reduction in serious crimes in 30 years. The crime detection rate in both years, however, declined from 2017 and 2018. Between 2019 and 2020, there was an annual average of 2,263 robberies, 544 less than the average between 2013 and 2018. Robbery detection rates, however, were the lowest since 2013. Between 2019 and 2020, there was an annual average of 85 kidnappings, 15 less than the average between 2013 and 2018. In a high-profile case, mother of three, Natalie Polonese, was rescued four days after being kidnapped in San Fernando. After her rescue, she wrote to the commissioner personally to thank him. According to the TTPS's figures, in 2019, TNT recorded 536 murders, the highest since 2008. Of those murders, only 42 were detected, a low detection rate of 7.8%. In comparison, the second lowest annual murder detection rate since 2013 was 13.6%. In 2020, TNT recorded 393 murders, the lowest since 2012. 57 murders were detected at a rate of 14.5%. Examining the statistics, it remains clear that homicide detection rates remain low. One of the areas that Griffith's tenure as commissioner has come under intense scrutiny has been police-related killings. Complaints to the Police Complaints Authority in 2019-2020 declined by 32 reports from 2018-2019. But during 2019-2020, there was a surge in police killings. There were 66 fatal police shootings and 31 non-fatal police shootings. Those were the most recorded in the previous eight annual reports. There were significant declines in overall crimes, murders, robberies and kidnappings in 2020. Many of the declines continued in 2021. But how much of it could be attributed to Griffith's policies as opposed to the pandemic? Well, Lundspun requested an interview with the commissioner, but he declined. Griffith said he did not want to prejudice the selection process for the next commissioner. There's a drop in crime, but you can't say that the drop in crime is because of the performance of the police service. The drop in crime had to do with the lockdown measures, right? And it's something that their scholars should be world over, showing that when these lockdown measures were put in place, crime declined. Right? So unfortunately, we can't even take the crime measure to evaluate the performance of the police service or the commission in any kind of systematic way. According to Unspun's research, in 2020, British police reported its biggest annual decrease in crime since 2010. The London School of Economics and Political Sciences reported, however, that violent crimes increased from pre-pandemic levels in deprived areas. In a study of 34 states, the U.S.'s National Commission for COVID-19 and Criminal Justice found that homicide rates declined at the start of the pandemic. However, there was a sharp increase in summer 2020. According to the Commission, while homicides declined from summer 2020 into early 2021, they remained higher than pre-pandemic years. Closer to home, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Jamaica and Barbados all recorded less murders in 2020 than in 2019. Criminologist Dr. Darius Figuera attributes the decrease in murders in TNT to a change in gang operations in the capital city. He says the change came after the shooting of three men by police in Mova in June 2020. That is when the, the new order, the new order in the game in Trinidad that was expressed to the people of Trinidad and Tobago when you had this organized demonstrations in Port of Spain, through conflicting spaces of gangland, and people were moving freely through and through, protesting. And today, the peace holds. Mm. The traditional heart of gangland is now like slumberland, getting on with making money. But criminologist Dr. Ramesh Diosaran says crime remains the police services Achilles' heel. It's an issue Dr. Diosaran indicated has continued to filter down into Griffith's tenure. Look, we have a state of emergency, which would imply people should be indoors, more careful about their whereabouts, whether you are a criminal or a law-abiding citizen. And we now head in for 200 murders the first half of the year. And I wouldn't get it to compare any to five years or four years ago. I mean, the first year that Gary Griffith came in, the second year on, those were the highest rate of murders in the country. And he did promise to do something about it, otherwise he'll resign. But that's another story. 
So serious crime and murders, the formation of gangs remain as they were, the borders remain as porous and as vulnerable as they were, the detection rates remain as low as they were. So I just don't know how to summarize this. It could mean that the problems are so complicated and needs so much more resources that the commissioner himself, whoever he or she might be, will not be able to do it as he or she would like. You need a lot of backup, both in terms of deputies and assistant commissioners, middle management, because as I said, the detection rate remains the same, gang formation continues to accelerate, uh, and in particular vulnerable areas. You know, only look at the numbers, you look at the accumulation of guns and ammunition here and there without arrests being made. You look at white color crime. So all these major indicators are not properly treated as yet. I am not reflecting this upon the commissioner himself because you have a whole police service. You have the defense force, you have the Coast Guard, you see? So you have other agencies and public interest groups who should also take part in the exercise. Stand by. Shortly after entering office, Commissioner Griffith launched his brainchild, the Special Operations Response Team. It was a team he handpicked to tackle elaborate criminal rings. In December 2018, SORT's first major bust took place in West Moorings. Four people were arrested and charged with possession for the trafficking of cocaine and marijuana. The $3.8 million bust was the first of many highly publicized raids that boosted public confidence in Griffith. In February 2019, a SWAT-led operation allegedly cracked a sex and drug ring operation in West Moorings and on Arapita Avenue. 18 suspects were arrested and $5 million was seized. Then in October 2019 came another high-profile raid. 69 people from ages 19 to 70 were allegedly held captive at the Transformed Life Ministries in Aruka. It was a story broken by Guardian Media. The head of the ministry was charged with kidnapping, false imprisonment, and trafficking in persons. In November 2019, businessman Patrick Abu Jr. was charged with five offenses, including possession of drugs, an illegal firearm, and ammunition. In September 2020, SWAT officers raided the popular drug susu operation in La Hoketa. Police initially seized $22 million, but the money was given back hours later. Investigations revealed several police officers were involved in the alleged illegal scheme. Days after the raid, the operation faced public scrutiny after videos were leaked, allegedly showing a member of the team stuffing money into his bulletproof vest. That video placed Commissioner Griffith on the back foot. Although it was a sought operation, he insisted the accused was not a police officer, but a defense force officer. In October 2020, police raided the operation again. They seized more than $7 million in cash as well as documents and electronics. Four officers were suspended while 11 others were transferred. The SS's founder, Karen Clark, was later charged with two counts of money laundering in early 2021. SWAT also played instrumental roles in many other key investigations and exercises. But while SWAT's successes were lauded by many, the unit also faced severe criticism from some for its alleged involvement in several fatal police shootings. In August 2019, 19-year-old Rochayan Ashtaman and his girlfriend, Kristen Series, were shot dead by SWAT officers in Santa Cruz. In December 2019, Michael Thomas was killed in Valencia. In January 2020, SWAT officers shot Glenn Bain dead. In April 2020, three men were killed while another was left injured in Lacano. In May 2020, infamous gang leader Nigel Myers, aka Defu, was killed in Mova. SWAT officers claimed that they were shot at first in all the killings. On February 21, 2021, however, the deaths of two men had serious consequences for a unit already under the microscope. Two suspects in the Andrea Barrett case, Andrew Morris and Joel Balcon, allegedly died in custody. Autopsies ruled that both men died of blunt force trauma. Fourteen police officers and six soldiers were questioned. In April, former SWAT head Mark Hernandez was charged with misbehaving in public office in relation to the investigation. Pending the outcome of his matter, he was suspended and later replaced by new sort head, Superintendent Roger Alexander. Well, the manner in which the leadership was changed simply indicates the modus operandi. What is most apparent to me is that with the change of leadership, 
comes the change in the modus operandi of, of the unit, which makes it very, very relevant and potent now. Your fifth term as police commissioner has been full of dizzying highs and controversial lows. And I think the last three years under the commissioner has been a, a rock and roll exercise, as it were, ups and downs. And um, this is not to criticize him. I think he has his personality, as everybody knows. When Joel Julian, in his first 100 days as commissioner Julian, Joel Julian had asked me what I think, how I would rate him. And I gave him at that early time eight out of 10 because of his passion, his enthusiasm. But later on, we begin to see, and he himself began to see the serious challenges in managing an organization that's complex with such heavy responsibilities and public accountability on one side and the politics on the other side. And I think um, he eventually became something of a lone ranger, leaving the police service a little too far behind in my view. So you have to judge him not as an individual with the passion to do the work, but you have to also consider whether the organization as a whole for which he's responsible has succeeded. So when he tells the public that he got 80% performance, his performance, and 59% that went for the police service performance. That gap, it needs inquiry as to why the police service, the officers themselves in their evaluation have such a relatively low score. So I would say to be very charitable is that he as an individual might have done well through his passion, but we have to look at whether what he did enhanced the value, the competencies, the performance of the police service as a whole. So that's a question mark that the police service commission will have to evaluate. Some of Griffith's highs for 2019, according to the TTPS, were the cracking of several human trafficking rings, more than 900 arrests as part of Operation Strikeback, 12 rescued kidnapped victims without ransom being paid, the seizure of 858 illegal guns, 10,928 rounds of ammunition, and 333.2 kilograms of cocaine, a $70 million reduction in the police overtime bill, the closure of email gate, plant-like substance gate, the Nelson matter and the Calabar Foundation matter, the promotion of 313 police officers and the suspension of 40 officers. Some of his highs for 2020, according to the TTPS, were the lowest murder toll since 2012, the largest reduction in serious crimes for 30 years, 34 officers suspended, 24 charged and 20 fired, 79.4% decrease in matters dismissed for complainant non-appearance, 300 officers promoted, and the introduction of pepper spray and tasers for officers. There were, of course, lows. Among several high-profile clashes, the commissioner clashed with the law association over a number of matters. These included his one-shot, one-kill policy, the deaths of the suspects in the Andrea Barrett case, the bail amendment bill, and the police's ability to enter private property under the public health ordinance. He was also at loggerheads with the Prime Minister on the issue of the police's ability to enter private property under the ordinance. In September 2020, the Prime Minister called on police to enforce the public health regulations equally. Persons who are partying and spreading this virus must feel the full brunt of the law in Trinidad and Tobago. This is not for me to tell the Commissioner of Police who to arrest and who not to arrest or how to apply the law. But as Prime Minister, I could tell the Commissioner of Police that the law must apply to protect us in Trinidad and Tobago from those who are not prepared to listen. He needs to know his position as the chair of the National Security Council, but he continues to make comments of policing and he does not have that authority or knowledge because this is the second time he has made the error. First, when he said the commissioner doesn't have the authority to, to go into supermarkets and, and banks to try to close them down um, because he wasn't aware. Then he came and he did a Michael Jackson moonwalk and then he corrected himself. He's doing the same thing again. He has given the impression to the country that we are selective, we are profiling, and we are not doing our job. But hypocritically, when we held the 27 persons just next door to Bayside and Silos, when they broke the law, breached the regulations, 
swimming in a public place, es- try to escape, were hiding, and we did not arrest them. He did not have a concern about it. But he has a concern for us not arresting four people or four or five people around a pool in private property where they were invited, and that it becomes a concern for him. He didn't have a concern when everybody was doing the left foot, right foot ball. He's in trucks for hundreds of persons, inclusive of carnage, and that was not a concern just a few weeks ago. Griffith later apologized, but with these remarks haunt him. The commissioner also had a grouse with a popular media house as well as members of the public on social media. Seemingly just for about every criticism he could find about himself on social media, he responded. Many online felt his energies would have been better spent on the job rather than responding. He has ensured that the commissioner of police is very present and vocal in the media. To his advantage or disadvantage, you'd say? Well, there has been great emphasis on media image. Do you consider his, his leadership style and that um, media presence to be um, suitable for the, the post of commissioner? Well, that's his way. I just view it. It's not a traditional way in Trinidad, but he will tell you he's not a traditional COP. And the commissioner must keep a level of dignity and appropriateness in dealing with the issues. The media needs the commissioner to respond always because he has a position and the media will need responses, clarifications, and they do that. But to allow the commissioner or anybody else to descend into personal insults and so on, when what is required is a proper discussion on the issues raised for the public interest, I think we have to be guarded against that. In his three years, the commissioner faced accusations from some quarters of being prejudiced against people from impoverished areas. Claims Griffith has denied repeatedly. On June 27, 2020, came arguably the commissioner's biggest test. Three men were allegedly shot by police in Mova. When that footage of the shooting went public, protests erupted across east port of Spain. It appeared in the CCTV footage that the men were allegedly shot with their hands in the air. While there were claims of extrajudicial killings against the police service before this incident, this one sparked widespread outrage. During protests in Silot, a pregnant woman, Ornella Greaves, was killed. Relatives claimed she was shot by an officer, but police denied the claim. The protests in Port of Spain lasted for three days, while more than 70 people were arrested. Seven officers were placed on administrative leave, while another 11 officers were placed on administrative duty. The incident continues to be investigated by the PCA. In retrospect, he seemed to have been caught in the middle of a rock and a hard place. Some sections of the community, and I don't want to use more adjectives than are required, some sections of the community would press for serious law enforcement, meaning the use of force appropriately. Law enforcement, rigid, robust law enforcement. And if that is implemented in certain areas, you get the other side now saying, well, uh, you can't be so brutal. You have to be gentle. You have to use community policing. You have to understand the young people in the area. And uh, they have been led astray. And the law enforcement is merely um, overreach. So the question is, what does a commissioner do? I think whatever he or she does, it has to be justifiable. And whatever controversy erupts, as long as a commissioner has a proper, viable, justifiable basis, he or she has no worry. But the question is, for example, and you, 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 you refer to the Mova issue. Um, there were videos that shows that the young men with their hands raised up who were allegedly still shot. Now that video is like the one with, with, with Mr. George in the United States, which triggered Black Lives Matter movement. Um, one in video creates more than a million stories. And I think that disturbed the process and put the commissioner in a corner. He didn't know what to do. You're asking me for s- strict law enforcement and um, to people that are called monsters and cockroaches and so on. And when that is applied, you're telling me I'm too um, uh, um, 
uh, uh, too rigid. But Dr. Figuera believes that a commissioner's performance should be judged on four main things. He calls them the four horsemen of the police apocalypse, the first being promotions. What we have now is this curious hybrid where you are promoted on the pleasure of the commissioner of police. And that will solve the problem because we need a system of promotion that is based on merit and performance. On merit, which is rooted in your perf job performance. For us to have retention of the talent of the police service and to attract new talent to the police service continuously, promotion has to be based on job performance. There have been promotions under the present commissioner, but we're still looking towards establishment. Secondly, according to Dr. Figueroa, a commissioner should be judged on how they handled internal discipline in the service. There is an entire structure for discipline in the police service that has collapsed, and there is no attempt to breathe life into it. The only attempt, the only talk be, that we had for two years is to change the terms, and, and the terms and conditions of service to enable the Commission of Police to dismiss people whenever they have been found short of the law. But that will solve the problem. Because during the course of the daily operation of the police service, you're going to have issues of discipline that arise that has to go through due process of law. The solution is not to fire everybody. So the, 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 the structure presently in place of the, the tribunals, that has to be brought back to life. And the author raised a third issue the commissioner should be judged on. And then there is the issue of command and control. And we continue to hear reports of instances of in the service which indicate that command and control continues to be a grave problem. The latest one being a police vehicle in the hands of a civilian. One media house reports that it was a derelict vehicle that was resurrected by a civilian and brought back on the road as a police vehicle with flashing blue lights and things like that. All of this, this is issues of command and control. You have a structure of command in the police service because it is a, it is, it is a paramilitary organization. Right. And therefore you have to have effective command and control where those, the chain of command operates towards the efficient operation of the police service. And it maintains discipline within the ranks in attaining the strategic goals of the police service. And the fourth criteria, Dr. Figuera pointed out, is the management of corruption and organized crime in the service. If you have a police service that, that is in a transshipping region for the, for the illicit drug trade, the burden now becomes even greater because of the ability of the transnational illicit drug trade to corrupt with the, with the wealth they command. So you have, you have repeated instances, and that is largely the, re, the, the, the cry from, from, from the public in their interaction with the police service. But despite his belief that all four issues remain present in the police service, Figuera believes there could be a legitimate argument that Griffith deserves another tomb. So the fact of the matter is, is that in the first three years, you have the argument in favor stating that when the present commissioner came in, we were in the midst of a bloodletting spree. So it was a holding operation. To date, the bloodletting spree has abated. So now you have breathing space to command the reform process. You can make that argument. The police service has never been as visible or as controversial for the last three years. I think along the way, he has come face to face with some serious challenges. Um, and if you notice, 
what the Public Service Commission put out in its advertisement. You will see the extent of responsibilities a commissioner has. He has to be more detailed. And I don't think Gary Griffith is a man for details. You know, he's more of a macro manager and um, that might be good. So what he would need, what whoever comes into the office for the next three years or so, would need some real strong backup to supplement the passion of the commissioner. Dr. Randy Sipazad believes three years is a short time span to judge a commissioner. He says it takes a considerable amount of time for someone to understand the inner workings of the service. The criminologist says more systematic evaluations of the police commissioner and the service need to be put in place. In the absence of those, he says, it's practically impossible for him to accurately review Griffith's performance. What they're supposed to do is look at what are the key functions of the commissioner, um, you know, and create evaluation criteria, collect systematic eva um, information in a kind of in a non-biased way and evaluate it, right? Um, the unfortunate thing is that these types of evaluations, if they're even done, are not necessarily made public, right? They're not public documents, unlike in many other countries. So, so it helps with accountability, it helps with transparency, and other researchers, uh, you know, could scrutinize the information, they could scrutinize the, the measures and all of that. What happens is that sometimes they use the most obvious data available, which is crime data. Um, and I say, unfortunately, because the crime rates aren't only a matter of the functioning of the Office of the Commissioner of Police or the police service. There are many, many factors outside of the control of the police service that could affect crime rates. So the crime problem is not just a problem for policing. Prisons will play a role in what happens with the crime levels. The courts and the way the courts function will play a role you know, the social systems that are in place. Dr. Dio Sarani, former chairman of the Police Service Commission, agrees that the selection metrics for the commissioner ought to be made more transparent. This is not to break any confidentiality, but the public, given the nature of the position of commissioner of police and the implications and consequences for the public interest, I think there should be more transparency provided by the Police Service Commission. I know there is some hesitancy because of the particular exercise of measuring a senior officer, but the greater balance should fall upon the public interest side. A hero to some, a villain to others, it's clear that Commissioner Griffith divides public opinion, but it won't be the public who ultimately decides his fate. That decision lies in the hands of the Police Service Commission. This year marks five years since the mother of two and hairdresser Ria Sukde was abducted and vanished without a trace. Her family is still holding on to the hope that one day they'll be reunited. Ria's father, Frankie Rajkumar, says it seems that those with money are the ones who get justice in Trinidad and Tobago. The pensioner believes his daughter is still alive. Otto Carrington shares this family's story five years after Ria's abduction in this segment of The Missing. This year marks five years since the kidnapping of hairdresser and mother Ria Sukdeo. In September 2016, the mother of two was abducted near her children's school at Picton Settlement. On that dreadful day, Ria's screams permeated the air, as many witnessed her abduction by men dressed as police officers. Since the kidnapping on September 16, 2016, her family still has no idea where she was taken or why. Still grieving over Rhea, her father, 68-year-old Frankie Rajkumar, says it seems that life has stood still since Rhea was snatched. Every day that you wake up in the morning, you know, you have to go through this every single day of your, you know, or all lives from now on. It's not easy. You know, sometimes people will tell you, well, okay, they know how you, f how I feel and, you know. Rhea was a mother of two, and to date the pain is still evident on special occasions. It's most painful for the family. Certain times, like for instance her birthday, you know, 
and thing and uh, you know when mother's day comes up and whatnot even at christmas time you know you know you get very emotional two years after rio went missing commissioner of police gary griffith visited the rajkumars but this was just a glimmer of hope rajkumar says it seems the law is for those who have stature in tnt i believe it works for people who are up there you know people who are up there who are wealthy who are famous and things like that it works for them for instance example some time ago when they kidnapped the gentleman from puffin stuff you know in a, in, in, a, in a quick time they found him you understand when miss pauline right was kidnapped for c3 right in no time they got her back he says now it seems that Rhea has been forgotten. People used to visit us, you know, come and you know have a you know a few words and for you know console us and whatnot, right? Um, but after a while, that is it. No one else, uh, not even a phone call from anyone. So, so it's very hard and difficult for us. Despite it all, he says the family has had to endure many stories about her whereabouts. All you're hearing is rumors. And rumors are rumors, you understand? Because I cannot go to the police and tell them, look, I hear so, you understand? Somebody said so. No, 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 no. You have to get concrete evidence, you know? So you're hearing rumors here. Sometimes you hear people say in the very early part that, oh, you know, I mean, you heard about this, that the, the media over there saw her in Venezuela. And we don't know that probably was a rumor, you don't know, because every media saw her. Why they didn't take out some pictures or something, something or the other? But Rajkumar is holding on to the hope that his daughter is still alive and they will soon meet again. I believe that she's alive and she's somewhere. And I have that hope that one day I'm going to see her, you know, because I believe in that. Anyone with information on Ria Sukdio's disappearance can contact the nearest police station or call 800 tips or 555. In our last episode, two weeks ago, we brought you the exclusive story about a teenage boy who was taken to Syria at the age of nine and later captured together with other relatives by US and Syrian forces. The teenager who has dual citizenship was later taken back to the U.S. while his relatives were charged with terror-related activities connected to ISIS. This has left the teenaged boy, who has since been cleared of any wrongdoing by the U.S. authorities, stuck at a foster home in the U.S. while his mother resides here and is willing to take him back. An exemption request was denied in January this year when former Minister of National Security Stuart Young held that post. He denied the request by the Child Services Division in New York to allow the child to return home, even indicating that he had relatives that had been charged for terror-related activities in the U.S. But now with the borders open, his family and the U.S. government says there's nothing stopping the child from returning home. Local lawyer Kristen Williams, who has been assisting in these and many similar cases, spoke to Unspun, saying that it is the boy's right to return. And if he stopped, then they'll exercise their legal options. Here's that interview. Mr. Williams, um, I'm, I'm, I wanted to do a follow-up, uh, ask a couple of questions uh, related to the story I did um, about two weeks ago, uh, related to a minor that has not been allowed into Trinidad and Tobago. And I understand that you are a part and parcel of that process to try and not only I'll get this child back home to its mother, but you're also part of a bigger case. Can you give us an update as to what has transpired since then in relation to this particular case and this minor? Okay, um, with respect to this particular case and this particular minor, we had a meeting with persons which represent um, the children's services in the United States, and they indicated to, to us that they wish to have the young boy return to his mother and, and reunified with his mother. Um, but so things are basically progressing. It's not an overnight fix. 
And there will be a bit of a protracted period, but we are confident that it will and it shall happen and it shall, it shall be returned to Trinidad and Tobago. What kind of support are you receiving or, or, or is the child and the child protective services receiving from the federal arm of the government in the United States uh, to make this happen? Because obviously, even if the American or the federal government say, hey, I'm going to send them across, send them uh, a chaperone by two U.S. marshals, they still need to get permission directly from the Ministry of National Security to allow this child into the country. How are they going to overcome that hurdle? Um, I believe that pursuant to Section 4 of the of the Immigration Act, once you're a national, you have a right to enter. So I don't foresee any difficulty him being a national Trinidad and Tobago, being afforded entry pursuant to the Immigration Act. Once he complies with the um, the provisions in this COVID period. But but the, the former Minister of National Security in January of this year denied his uh, travel exemption that was uh, put forward by the Child Protective Services. So that's why I'm asking that question now. What has changed since that I did this story? What has changed since then that you all are confident and optimistic that now in the coming weeks that the child will be allowed, not just based on the law of what you're quoting, but because you obviously need the, the cooperation of the National Security Ministry here? Yeah. Um, well, basically, remember on the 17th, the borders have been reopened to nationals. And once the borders are reopened to nationals, that will basically take away the need for an exemption that would have created a hurdle on a prior occasion. So that hurdle no longer exists. However, there is exist that, that, that allegation of guilty by association still hanging over the child's head. As mentioned by the former Minister of National Security, Stuart Young, uh, do you foresee then any kind of hindrances or problems if the child gets to Trinidad and Tobago and gets, gets to immigration and then there's something in the immigration system that red flags the child based on the Minister of National, former Minister of National Security's uh, denial of entry uh, back in January? And would that be something that would be flagged even if six months later? Even if though the water is open. Yes, um, well, that is what actually um being a part of like an attorney at law, that will be part and parcel of the whole process to have him successfully reunited with his mother. Meaning, um, should there be any hindrances in Trinidad and Tobago, we would actually be um in a position to go to court at very short notice to ensure, just like all other nationals, a Trinidadian is ensured his right of entry pursuant to that immigration act. So we would have pre-planned our particular court actions anticipating any movement or moves by the Ministry of National Security. Now, I, I remember sending a couple of questions to the Attorney General uh, for my last story. Uh, of course, they still remain unanswered. And um, I know one of the crux of the, the, the matter is the, the amendment of the terrorism uh, bill for 2020. Uh, and it seems to be, uh, as Dr. Jervis would have pointed out in our prior uh, interview a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, the, the need to look at some of this legislation in detail. Um, and I know now that you are, you are involved in also assisting um, children stuck in the camps in Syria, the refugee camps in Syria. Um, and uh, can you just outline us, what are some of the concerns? I understand you, a letter has been sent uh, you know, outlining some concerns to, the, to the, the various ministries by your office. Can you just give us in a nutshell what those concerns are and how you hope that the, the, the amendment bill will make adjustments to ensure that there is fairness, equity, and, and the, the rights of these children and women are not violated? Okay, um, very good question, Mark. Basically, in that draft bill, children, once they are classified as something called a returnee, they must agree to a period of two years detention, guilty by association, whether or not there's enough evidence to support a criminal charge or not. However, um, that must be wrong in any construct in any part of the entire world. Um, so that, for example, will be an example of what we really need to change in that particular act, because we cannot have like a Guantanamo Bay for kids, that would just be wrong for our national image. And um, I mean, I'm a Trinidadian. I would like our image in this country to be one that supports and encourages 
and defends the human rights of children especially. No, I, I, I was looking at a, a BBC documentary recently where they were allowing uh, children to be repatriated back to England. However, there seems to be this agreement or premise that the, the mothers of these children cannot be repatriated back to the United Kingdom. And obviously one of the mothers said that doesn't make sense because I have to be with my children. How are we going to, to, to combat such a situation if it does arise here where they might tweak the law or, or decide that they will allow the children back in if there is no ample evidence to suggest in any way that they are connected to, to any terrorist organization? How are, we, how are you, you positioning yourself to try to justify why the law has to be, uh, the amendments to the bill has to be looked at carefully and maybe tweaks made to it? Okay, um, the mothers may be considered the primary caregiver for the, for the children. And um, our objective really and truly should be the prevention of the spread um, of the ISIS methodology and also to prevent creating an ISIS 2.0, 3.0. And that particular um, nuance, we must, um, we ought to take into consideration whether or not there would be a grievance by this young child when he gets older and he realizes, wait, my mother, there's no evidence against her. She went across there and we don't know the circumstances in which she went across there. But there being not enough evidence to support a criminal charge, I would think it would be in the best interest of everyone in the world actually to prevent that sort of grievance by separating a child from a mother especially in the absence of any sort of tangible evidence to support a criminal charge. So oh. when we look at it from those lens, we must then realize the primary caregiver for the child and see how best we could not separate a mother from her child. And that's a legal argument that we more than likely would have to pursue in the future. Well, definitely, there's also that human interest aspect as you pointed out and as Dr. Jervis would have pointed out in the last uh, interview as it relates to the United Nations uh, convention of the rights of the child, correct? Yes, yes, correct. Um, I will speak about mothers. I, I know that uh, his mother has to remain anonymous, and I know you would have spoken. So, what has been, uh, you know, having not been able to see your son for more than six years after being unceremoniously taken from her by a relative and carried to taken to Syria, only to learn in a phone call time after that her son was there, her nine-year-old son at the time, or ten, nine going on ten, now 16. Um, what has that been like for the mother? I mean, you would have been speaking with the mother, and um, what is he anticipating, and how has the child been able to, you know, to cope with this traumatic experience over the last few years? Okay, um, with respect to the mother, firstly, I would say um, it's a sense of joy, as well as, um, a sense of relief that the possibility of being reunited with her, her son is an actual reality. Um, that doesn't mean, for example, that the mother would not have concerns that other mothers and other parents and other Trinidadians will have with children still across there. For example, there may be the need to transmit money across the children across there to simply ensure their right to life for basic humanitarian and relief items. So those will be topics that she may seriously have, you know, like, because you move away from just seeing about yourself to caring about a group of persons. So when we look at the totality of this situation we find ourselves in, that's one issue that she will feel that sense of relief with respect to the young boy. Um, well, we spoke to the young boy and I think that, um, that he's doing fine. He is in a safe place, a safe space, trying his best to live life like a regular teenager, go to school. So there's a positive outlook for him. Yeah, I mean, I know that because the other relatives are now uh, in, in incarcerated in the United States, he's in a foster home, as I would have pointed out in the last report. Yes. Uh, I know there is that longing to, to be reunited with his mother. How do you see that, that playing out you know, when he comes back to Trinidad? Is he is he any way traumatized? Is he suffering from post traumatic stress? Uh, are, are the right uh, channels being uh, you know tapped into to get him the assistance that he needs when he gets back to Trinidad as well? I am sure he probably is being helped in the United States. But obviously that that treatment 
has to continue here. Um, what I would say is that like, I wouldn't really like to say um, his personal diagnosis, right? Like whatever they have diagnosed him with personally, I really wouldn't like to delve into that, you know, just like that technical and privilege and confidentiality. Or what I would say is that we on our side, together with Dr. Jervis, we are making sure that we act in the best interest of our country, first and foremost, the best interest of our clients also, to have the proper support mechanisms to support someone who has returned from a war slash conflict zone. Because that's something that I'm sure both you and I, we have never been in that particular area, nor do we have the special expertise to deal with that type of situation, which I don't have. But we have a team of professionals, international professionals, that we have engaged on this process. All right, Mr. Williams, I know you will definitely keep us up to date on uh, this, um, this story, this continuing story. And I want to thank you again for appearing here on, on SPUN and um, uh, keep us posted. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, You're bye. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us here on this edition of Unspun. We hope to see you in two Sundays from now when we're hoping to bring you a fresh batch of stories that matter to you. Remember, if you have any story tips for Unspun, please ensure you drop us an email at unspun at cnc3.co.tt or call us at 800-CNC3. Until then, have a good one. And remember, be the change you want to see in the world. And please, stay safe and stay home.